Happy New Year. You know, I love the new year. I love that holiday time from November 1st to January 1st. It's amazing. You walk into a store, people say Happy Thanksgiving. You then are welcomed by Merry Christmas. And you have kind of that week period where it's Happy New Year. But there's one phrase I really wish that we did not adopt as a culture. And that's the phrase, New Year, New You. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Everywhere, I'm, I'm all watching all these commercials and infomercials, new year, new you. And just something inside me makes me cringe because we know we all set these new year resolutions, these goals, and we're often met by failed expectations. How many of you have ever seen those photos before? We have expectations and then reality. We've all gone through these moments where we have these grandiose ideas of this year it's going to be different. And then January 2nd happens. <laughs> December 31st, you set those goals. I'm going to eat clean. I'm going to eat well. And then January 1st comes. You're like, it's still a holiday. <laughs> These calories don't count today, but they'll count on the 2nd. See, we go through these failed expectations, and we start these years with so much hope, but we're met with these failed expectations. And we notice that as you get older, you start to dread January. You start to dread these New Year, New You resolutions because you've had so many years of failed expectations that start to pile up. The New York Times did this article on New Year's resolutions, and they said that 50% of all Americans make these resolutions. But out of those 50%, only one out of 10 will complete them. That's a 90% failure rate on resolutions. So we have an entire culture that's living under this illusion of failure. We live under this pressure of failure, of not measuring up, of not meeting the standard, of not meeting these expectations. But we have to ask, what's the motivation of these goals that we're actually setting out to fulfill and accomplish? And in the past, we've talked about mindset and motivation. I spoke on self-control a couple months ago. You can look that up. But there's one other element that I came across that has to do with goals and accomplishing things. And it actually has to do with your future self. And what they've learned is this, is that our present day self, we can think about ourselves in maybe one, two, three months, maybe a year away. When we talk about our life 10 years in the future, when we think about that person, we actually view them as a stranger we'll never know. Here's what one reporter said. It turns out that we see our future selves as strangers. The people we become in a decade or more are unknown to us. That bright, shiny New Year's resolution, if you feel perfectly justified in breaking it, it may be because it feels like it was a promise someone else made. So we make these promises, these resolutions, but when we're faced with present-day temptation... We sacrifice it. We push our problems off to a future person that we don't know. They hooked up people's brains to these uh, neurotransmitters. And as they started to ask them questions about their present self and who they actually were, they would see these different responses in the brain. However, the further and further they went out into that person's future, as they asked questions, it turns out that your brain responded in a way that when you talked about your self 10 years from now, it was like talking about a celebrity you've seen on TV. TV that you'll never actually meet. It's, you're so estranged from this actual person that when you start making these goals, you just push the problem off. One scientist did a test called the disgust test. So in this test, they created this concoction of ketchup and soy sauce. Here's a picture of a ketchup container. Now, I am not a ketchup fan, personally. How many ketchup fans out there? Not for me. I've learned that my English family is here. Um, Ketchup is not just a condiment, it's a food group in England, <laughs> I've learned. And when I started having the English over, one of the common questions you would get from them when you had pizza was, where is the ketchup? And it just, oh, oh. Anyways, so they create this concoction of ketchup and soy sauce so that the immediate response when you smelled it was this gag reflex. So they brought people in, and they would have them smell it, and they would say, this special serum will advance medical development. And 
the, our success will be determined by how much you'll actually ingest. So how much would you be willing to ingest today? When people would smell it, they, they would say two tablespoons. That was kind of the average, so one ounce. Now, they would bring other people in. They would smell it, and they would say, we want to give this to strangers, and it will further science. How much do you feel that people would be willing to ingest? And they would say four ounces, a half cup. They then asked the same question. And they said, three months from now, how much would you be willing to ingest? Different people, they'd say, I'd be willing to ingest four ounces, maybe a half cup in the future. Now, what they learned is that same person, present day, when faced with it, would say one ounce, but we would prescribe up to four times as much for our future self. We push these problems off on this distant person like it's a stranger we'll never meet. But the problem is when we keep pushing off these problems, we one day wake up as that future person. And we're faced with those future problems, those future unresolved relationships. Here's what it says. We might choose to procrastinate and let some other version of ourselves deal with problems or chores. We can focus on that version of ourself that derives pleasure and ignore the one that pays the price. So there's this future you that's going to pay the price for decisions we make today. So what we tend to do is we sacrifice the future for the pleasure of the present. Our present day is so in front of us and so much our reality, we live in the mindset, well, tomorrow is maybe not promised to anybody, and we consume things and we do things that end up becoming our own detriment. And we could talk about a future self, but maybe that present day self has woken up to past decisions that you've made and now it's your present reality. And what we do is we wake up and we face these problems, we face these feelings of failure, and we've learned to adopt the cultural norm. We've learned to put masks on. We've learned to wear the mask of everything's okay. We've learned to wear the mask of I'm successful and I don't need others' help. But see, what Paul says, I really believe, is a key to transformation. There's a couple verses in the Bible about transformation. But I believe Paul gives us two key elements here that I believe are the gateway for true and authentic transformation. It says this in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And all of us with unveiled face, seeing the glory of the Lord as reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into that same image. See, this journey of transformation starts with removing the mask. We have to remove that veil, those things that we cover up our life with, those things that we create these illusions with. The moment we remove them, that's when true transformation can start. Are you with me? This is that journey. And the word Paul uses here in 2 Corinthians 3.18 is a word he also uses in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, which is a little bit more noted by people. But this word transformation is metamorpho. It sounds cool, right? It's where we get the word metamorphosis. And we've all talked about metamorphosis before. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, don't be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the image. It's this inward transformation, this inward change that has to take place. Now, when we think of transformation, the common illustration is a caterpillar to a butterfly. We all know that, the wonder and awe of butterflies. You've ever gone to one of those butterfly parks and they come and land on your hand? It's the most magical experience of your life. See, my kids love the book, The Hungry Caterpillar, but I got corrected by them. I heard it's caterpillar, not caterpillar. I will probably say it wrong for the next two minutes, so make sure you note every time I say it incorrectly. However, we have these caterpillars that crawl around like these fuzzy worms. I remember catching them as a child and we hold them and they, they crawl and they form these cocoons and this transformation process takes place and out comes this incredibly beautiful butterfly. However, that process of transformation is concealed. We don't get to see that caterpillar dissolve and come back to life inside of this cocoon. You see, our transformation process is a little bit more like the frogs. Here's a picture of a tadpole. Now, when you see this cute little tadpole, you've caught them in water before. When we think of frogs, we think of these ugly things sometimes, but if you talk about the frog being yourself, you may think of a pretty frog like this one, one of the tropical frogs. 
that are cute and warm and colorful, but often poisonous, as some of you are. <laughs> Just kidding. Ouch. That, it's really personal right there. Just kidding. However, the process of transformation from tadpole to adult frog is incredibly disgusting. Here's what it actually looks like. You have this weird amphibian that's losing its skin and shedding its tail. It's a foul process. In the middle of its transformation, it's slimy, it smells, and that's actually what our transformation process looks like as believers. See, the moment you say yes to Jesus, it's this process of shedding your old self to have a new creation. It's this process where you undergo sensitivity and all those things that were impure start to come out. That's the journey of transformation. That's a messy process. But what happens is we put on masks to cover up that transformation and don't remove it to actually be honest about the transformation God wants to have us go through. So when we come down for prayer at the altar about a struggle, and then next week someone asks how you're doing, we obviously, well, I got prayed for next week, last week. I'm all good. I'm all delivered. This magic wand of deliverance doesn't always happen that way. See, God wants to be a part of the incremental growth process. Your community wants to be a part of the incremental growth process because that's how God designed change to happen. But we become so accustomed to covering our faces, to covering up the dirty parts of our life, we never truly change. But Paul says we have to approach God's presence and glory with an unveiled face. Now he gives this obscure reference to a significant time in Israel's history. He's talking about Moses. So Moses goes up to this mountain, and as he's on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, the glory of God passes him by. It's so impactful that his face literally starts to glow and radiate with God's presence. So when he comes down from the mountain, the people of Israel are terrified of him because they know if you've seen the glory of God, you'll die. So when they see him, they think, oh man, is he literally like God among us? And when he speaks, they revere him. They fear what he says. And when he goes back, it says that he puts this veil on his face in the meantime until he goes to the tabernacle in which he removes the veil. The glory of God comes. He shows his face to the people of Israel and puts the veil back on. There's not a lot of commentary on Exodus as to why he does this. However, Paul opens some commentary up that lots of people debate, but I think is, is pretty straightforward. The 2 Corinthians 3.13. It says this, We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. What does this mean? Paul's take on it, and as I studied this, a lot of people believe they, Moses put the veil over his face so that the people of Israel wouldn't see the power or glory fade. They wouldn't see the glory leaving him. Out of insecurity that they would not revere him as their leader or as God's ordained person. See, this is often what happens in our journey as believers. We encounter the glory and presence of God. We get transformed in some significant way, but how many have ever noticed that camp high starts to go away? And as that camp high goes away or that deliverance or that salvation starts to go away, the glory starts to fade a little bit. And what we do is we cover up that fading glory with the mask of religion. We cover up that fading glory with all the Christian words we love to say. How are things going? Hallelujah, brother. It's amazing right now. God is so good. And inside you're like, it's really bad. It's terrible, actually. If I were to be honest, I might disappoint someone. That's the illusion the enemy loves to use. And what happens is we, prevent, or we present this person that the glory is always present. And what it actually does is when a new believer gets saved and they see this fake glory on people, when they actually hit a hard time, they think God's left them. They think that God maybe has ignored them because God's not real to them like he's real to that other person. You see, part of the transparent life, part of growth as a believer is learning to be vulnerable and remove that mask of religion and to not cover up and pretend like everything's fine. This is why I love the ministry Celebrate Recovery here at The Rock. 
We all have struggles and areas of addiction that we've gone through, and we need support and community to go through that process of transformation. As Paul later says in this verse, it's from glory to glory, from a good place to a better place that God needs to take us. And that happens in the context of community. You see, Jesus called it out. This mask of religion is what the Pharisees wore. And in Matthew 23, here's Jesus. He's confronting the Pharisees. It's a famous passage called the woe of the Pharisees. He says, behold, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but on the inside, they're full of the bones of the dead, all kinds of filth. So you also on the outside look righteous to others, but inside are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. See, this is a, a dire, accusation he gives towards them see that word hypocrite really comes from a community called the hypocrites which were these actors these play actors they would wear these masks and they would put on these roles here's a picture of some famous masks that were discovered so they would wear these masks and they were these caricature actors and this is what jesus actually accuses the pharisees of being these play actors and as you study this, it's, it's actually kind of veiled as he insults them. He actually says that they're worse in some ways than Gentile leaders. You see, there's these other letters that are written about hypocrites that would have been well known to the Jewish scholars of the time. And what Jesus is alluding to is you're really fake. And not just fake, you're fake in a way where God would never want to be with you. It's a really intense insult. And see, what happens is, is we wear these masks of religion like everything's going to be fine. Everything's okay. But in order for us to be transformed, we have to start getting honest with our present condition. We have to be honest. As a leader, as a friend, as a pastor, whatever it is, it's time to start sharing those vulnerable areas in your life. We make it a point, Mark, Ryan, Bob, and I, whoever's speaking, we have to share stories of our vulnerability, of those moments where we blow it. I love it when Bob shares Mad Bob stories. <laughs> this is my favorite moments, because it's in those moments we go, that's what's real. That's real. I love sharing when I'm terrified to pray for someone, because it's real. We have this inward commentary, and I've worn that mask of religion. I remember I had a radical encounter with the Lord at 19. I devoted a season of prayer where every week I would pray. And one of my friends named Clayton, I would say, hey, you know, I really want to start praying with you. We invited some other friends. And every week we would pray together. And we had these awesome times in the presence of God. Well, we started to hear about fasting. So because we were spiritual, we were supposed to fast. So we said, okay, every Wednesday we'll start juice fasting until, until we pray. And then we'll eat afterwards. Well, we would juice fast, and then one day, one of our friends says, I'm not going to eat tonight. God told me to still fast. I said, okay, that's fine. So the next week, someone comes and said, yeah, God called me to, to water fast now. Juice, juice isn't enough. I said, okay. So it became this competition. <laughs> Who's going to fast more? And so now I wasn't fasting one day. I'm going to fast two days. And then two days would happen, and yeah, yeah, no, I started fasting on, you're going to fast Wednesday, Thursday. I'm going to fast Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, just to make sure I'm ready for our prayer meeting. And I remember that one Wednesday when I go and I wake up, and I've been fasting, I wake up, I'm so hangry, it's unbelievable. I'm just famished, and I'm starving, and I, I guiltily eat this bowl of cereal. And I'm like, I broke the fast. What am I going to tell my friends? And I go that night, and we're about to pray, and we had this kind of, you know, accountability time. I say, hey, guys, I got to confess. I ate cereal this morning. <laughs> and Clayton goes, I'm so glad you said that. I ate a burger at lunchtime. <laughs> and literally, the grace to fast lifted, and none of us could fast anymore. Because we had so much religion that was fueling our perception of success and maturity. It was false. See, it's God's grace that needs to enable and empower us. God's grace in the journey, it's not about how spiritual you look. It's about what his spirit is doing internally that matters. And what Paul says is when we remove the mask, we behold, we, we look into the glory of the Lord as if looking into a mirror. And 
again, what our modern concept of mirrors is really different than a first century concept. I know many of us can't remember the first day we actually saw our reflection in a mirror like this baby did one day for the first time. <laughs> However, when we actually see our image now, I have a high probability to believe that what I see in a mirror is true and not fake. That it's actually probably a, an accurate representation of what I look like. However, in the first century, the mirrors they used were incredibly dirty and dark. This is what some pictures of the different mirrors would have looked like. They were these hand mirrors, as you can see. Paul gives us a greater insight in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3. He says, behold, we will look into a mirror dimly and darkly. This was the perspective. They never actually saw their image. The first image was in the reflection of water. So what happens is as technology starts to improve, they take these different precious metals and they start to carve them and open them. This is what one historian says. For a single one of these mirrors, chiseled silver or gold, inlaid with gems, women are capable of spending an amount equal to the dowry of the state once offered to poor general's daughters. So one of these mirrors in, in gold would literally cost you a fortune that was unfathomable. They're expensive and costly. So what Paul's alluding to is these mirrors are valuable. Not many would get their hands on a mirror, but there's also another implication here. First century mirrors weren't just some decorative piece. They were often decorated with different gods that they would worship. It goes on to say this. Most were ornamented with images of the gods, especially Pan, god of the wild, Eros, god of desire, and Aphrodite, goddess of beauty and love. So what they believed is this, is that these mirrors had magical power. And what you needed, you would have on that mirror. And as you look at the image, that power would translate into you. So if I needed love, I would get the love and affirmation from that mirror. And Aphrodite would make me more beautiful in my appearance. That if I needed power, I would have the god Pan on there, who's the god of the wild, who was the shepherd of the wild. And therefore, that ache for power would fuel my image. This is what drove the motivations of most people. And what Paul says is this. He says, the mirror you're looking into is the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So the image you're looking at is Jesus. He's the God you worship, and as you look at him, his glory will change you. As the glory changed Moses, so it will change you, not like these artificial gods of the age. See, as you look into that mirror, you actually start to become the image of Jesus because they believed the glory of God was his presence that had power. And as that power was there, he uses this word image or icon, which means to, to craft and to mold. It was this really elaborate word that he uses that has different usages, but the particular usage he uses here was one that was only referenced with the gods or those they thought were gods among men. And he says, as you look into the glory of God, you're being transformed into the image of Jesus. And what we have to ask this morning is, for genuine transformation to take place, what mask are you wearing that you need to remove? And what mirror of motivation are you looking into? Are we looking at the motivation of success, of appearance, of love, of lust? Or is Jesus really our aim? Because they believed the mirror you looked in was what you would become. For us, we have to understand when Paul's talking about being transformed into the image of Jesus, he's not talking about just some simple reflection. He's talking about us being formed into the image of Jesus so that when people see us, they see him. That's our goal. That's our motivation. When you think of resolutions, when you think of change, what if our goals stopped being so materialistic and started to be more majestic? Started to be more anchored in who Jesus actually is. As Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. See, he knows you, he's predestined you, and what we have to do is say yes to the work of transformation. He's called us to live out, and you'll look a little bit more like Jesus in that journey. As we close this morning, would you welcome my friend Stephanie as she shares her story. Thanks, 
guys. So I want to share a little bit of my identity story with you today. And like all good identity stories, it starts in the 80s. Um, so it was December 1989. It was the day of the church Christmas pageant. And I was ready. I was looking good. My hair was perfectly crimped and a side ponytail. My bangs were also crimped. I don't know why we did this to ourselves. I was in my hunter green taffeta and velvet and lace dress with matching tights and shoes. Um, I was ready to go. This was the day where I got to perform my first ever solo. I got to sing on stage at church. I was about five or six years old. And uh, in this pageant, I was singing Away in a Manger to Baby Jesus. So I got to be part of the nativity scene. You had the wise men from the east, you had the shepherds from the fields, and then you had me recently off of a Glamour Shots shoot or something. I don't know. It somehow worked. So, so that was it. And it must have gone well. I don't remember it super well. Um, but it must have gone well because the music director uh, actually came to me and said, we want you to do special music in our church every month. We're going to put you on a special rotation. You get to sing. So I got to be uh, trained up in the church, being on stage. This was the beginning of my long and illustrious musical career. I was the girl that got to go into that sacred booth in the back of Family Christian Center, you know, and find the cassette tapes of Amy Grant so that while I'm singing, I have like a full horn section behind me. <laughs> so, so this was my life. And I have a six-year-old niece, and she just won a science competition. And I saw her receive her award, and I thought, this is so special, because this is a moment where she knows she's good at something. She's going to grab hold of this. It's going to give her confidence. It's going to help her grow in her skill. And what a, what a special thing to happen at such a young age. I can say that now, but my reality as a six-year-old, uh, being on stage, being in front of people, was anything but a blessing for me. Uh, the reality that I walked through was one of uh, self-criticism, self-hatred, and self-harm. And that happened from a very young age. After I would sing, or even as I'm preparing to sing, my entire body would react with anxiety, fear. I would feel sick. Um, when I got on the stage, I would get off as quickly as possible, and I would go and cry because it wasn't good enough. And I would go and hide because I didn't want to have to hear people's response or hear what they thought. And it wasn't the criticism that I was afraid of. It was the compliment because I didn't want them to see on my face. I was trying to hide that I didn't believe them. This, again, was my reality. And it wasn't just on stage. This was my reality in daily life. It was getting up. It was, it was going out in public. It was me just by myself. And all of this was happening in, um, in parallel with a life that I truly loved God. And I knew that he loved me. I was in church. I believed, this, I believed the word. But, but this was a mask that I wore. Fast forward to my 20s. I'm listening to a podcast on spiritual warfare. It sounds super exciting. It was super dry. I was taking notes just to stay awake. I was like, there has to be something good in here. It's going to come. Um, so something did. Um, one of the points that he made was, uh, oftentimes you'll know that you're either under demonic oppression or you're in the middle of spiritual warfare. If you start hearing voices in the second or third person instead of the first so in other words, instead of me thinking, I want salad, I would hear, you want donuts, or she wants Chick-fil-A, you know, that kind of thing. So, so that's the kind of thing that you, that you would be hearing. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder if that's ever happened to me and just was kind of doing an audit of my past. Like, has there been a moment where that really happened? And it you know how that, the flashes come. It's like a flashback. And I'd thought of this memory before. It wasn't like the first time I'd remembered it. But it was the first time I put it in this context. I remembered being a little girl, so small, that I went in my mother's bathroom and I couldn't see myself in the mirror. I had to climb up onto the toilet, climb up onto the counter, sitting on my knees, looking at myself in the mirror. And I was sobbing. And as I'm looking at myself in the mirror, this is what I'm saying. Some girls aren't good enough. 
Some girls aren't pretty. Some girls shouldn't be heard. Some girls shouldn't be seen. At that moment in my life, at a very young age, I believe that a shadow fell over me that I walked in for the rest of my life. It was a tainted mirror that I was looking into, and it affected every single interaction. It affected self-talk, it affected talk with others, it affected ministry, and I had to fake a lot of things. So this is what I realized in my 20s, and two things happened. First, I got angry. I got mad because I got ripped off. Something had been stolen from me, and I got mad for that little five-year-old that the enemy didn't care about kicking while she was so little and putting herself out there. I got mad. So then the second thing that happened was I got determined. I need to overcome this. Something needs to change. I can't live in this anymore. I have to be free. But I needed more than an overcoming attitude. I needed the Spirit of God to deliver me. There was a deliverance that needed to happen because it was bigger than me. I already knew I wasn't seeing in reality. I actually just watched a colorblind simulator. Have you guys ever watched those where it gives you the filter of what a colorblind person sees? And it's hard to see the reds and the greens or the blues and the purples. And my brother's colorblind, so I was interested in seeing that. And I thought, wow, he has no concept of the reality that I get to walk in and see every day. It's like that's where I was. So I couldn't talk myself into saying, see green better, see red better. I needed something to be transformed. So I prayed, and I, in, in my way of thinking, when we're, when we're talking about deliverance, I think there's two main ways that God does this. One is that, as Ryan was mentioning earlier, it's that crossing over moment. It's going over the Red Sea. You were a slave. You are now free. There is an entire ocean in between. You have burned the bridges. You've burned the boats. You're not going back. This is the story that Bob, of Bob's life of being delivered from alcoholism, right? And when a lot of us have those, those are those miraculous delivery, instantaneous moments. Those are the ones we want because they're a lot easier. They're a lot easier to get from one side to the other. But God delivers us in another way too. And that's the wandering part. It's the shedding off of the sin every single day. It's the changing and the transformation and the restructuring of your chemical makeup and your brain and your way of thinking. It's the being renewed day by day. And God can transform us and deliver us in that way too. So that's how I was walking that out. I was still getting up on the stage. And every time I did, God would do something. He would shed something. He would change something. And I walked this out for a while and I thought, you know, this is going to be my life journey. It's going to happen all the time until one day. <laughs> and I told Brandon, I want to pause on this, on this line, until one day. There's a lot of hope in that statement, right? When you're reading a story or watching a movie and you get to the part, it was always like this, until one day, something happened. And I want to tell you, I wanted to stay here for a moment because there's so much hope in this statement and we have this hope, every one of us, for today, for tomorrow, for eternity. One day, it will all be restored. We will all be renewed. It will be completely new. So here's my one day. One day, I woke up from a spiritual dream. God had given me this dream. I'm writing it down. And he's speaking to my spirit and telling me, this is for that girl, this girl that you know. And I'm like, cool. I'll pray about this and agree with you, Lord. And he says, no, no, no. You need to deliver this to her. I'm like, eh, this girl does not like me, Lord. I would go as far as saying this girl hates me. I don't want to give her this message. She's not going to hear me. It's not going to go well. Somebody else can do it. Nope. You, you got to tell her. You got to speak this word to her. So like a good daughter, I say, sure. Yeah. Uh, if I run into her today and we end up sitting next to each other and there's like an extra half an hour and nobody's talking, I will share this with her. So <laughs> we end up at a concert sitting next to each other and the, there's technical difficulties so the music's not starting for half an hour. I'm not getting out of it. So I, so I tell her 
this word that God had given me for her. She's sobbing. The spirit of God is so precious and sweet there. And she says, Stephanie, I, I received this word of God from you. I hated you. Will you forgive me? And I say, yes, I, I forgive you. I forgive you. And I can't describe this moment to you. Lightning, presence of God, warmth, friendship, love. Jesus was there. And he's speaking to me and he says, the girl who hated you delivered this message. You are receiving this word for yourself, from yourself, from me. And I'm like, does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? This, I delivered a word to a girl who hated me. She received it and asked forgiveness. I was now receiving that word for myself from a girl who hated me. And I was receiving forgiveness. And here's what that word was really quickly because I'm already running late. I saw um, in my dream, I saw a horse running inside a pen, running around and around. And I could see it was anxious and frantic and it needed to get out. And when I watched it, the, most, the biggest impression I got was my heart was aching for the horse. I knew it was beautiful and strong and it needed to be free and needed to be let out. And God's hand of mercy reached down and opened up the gate and let it free. And as my heart kind of, again, started aching for the loss of so much lost time, so much lost energy, he said, don't fret about what was wasted. This will all fuel the fire to run farther and to bring others free. That's the word that I received that day. And you know, when God meets you and encounters you in a very supernatural way, sometimes you wonder, how is this going to how is this going to affect my day to day? How is this going to affect my, my normal daily life? I'll tell you what happened for me. The next morning I woke up, I looked in the mirror, and I did not recognize myself. And I didn't change. My eyes had been opened. And that shadow that I'd been walking in for years, for decades, Suddenly, I was in the light of the reality of God's love. I was staring into his glory, which was my own reflection, his love for his creation, for his daughter, who believed him about me. And that is the transformation that is available for each of you today. The reality of God's love, looking in his face, knowing that you are hidden in his love, that you are acceptable to him, that you can approach the throne of his grace with confidence because you look just like Jesus. Can we pray together now? All right. <laughs> Father God, I am humbled by the tenacity with which you track us down with your love. You go after us. And as much as we feel like we have to plead for transformation and change, God, would you rescue? God, would you help? God, would you restore? God, would you save? You Desire even more so to give those things freely and to have us with hearts that are willing to receive. So God, right now I pray that everyone here that is suffering behind a mask or is suffering looking in a tainted mirror, God, would you bring the reality of Jesus, your love, your acceptance, and the truth of your word in your name. Amen. 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 Let's just stand together real quick. Give it up for Steph. She did an amazing job. I love it. Just invite the prayer team forward. If you can, prayer team here. Just go to grab a hand of a person next to you as we close out here. Father, we just thank you so much for your goodness and your kindness. And this morning, we just declare we will remove the masks that we wear. Those masks, those illusions that we begin to carry around. God, would you remove them and give us the strength to identify them. So just this morning, as we pray, as we go back in the car, help us find those things we hide behind. Secondly, Lord, would you show us the mirrors that we're looking into? Those false mirrors, those false idols, those images that we're desiring to create that you never intended. God, would you help us to be conformed into your image and likeness? Lord, we're expectant for the authentic identity that you're forming in us. So Holy Spirit, do your work. In Jesus' name.